I'll say like, hey, babe, why do I, I live in a box, right? I go outside, I get on a box, I get inside of a box with wheels. I take that box, drive to another box, go to that box, go inside of that box, and then sit inside of another box. What are we doing? Why is this the way that we have to work? Why was this the standard way of working? What up, what up, what up, unicorns? Ugly unicorns, what's poppin'? It's your boy, Eric Abram. Welcome to another episode of the UX Unicorns Podcast. How you doing? Everyone, how you doing? Look, I know I'm late to the party, but Happy New Year. <laughs> happy New Year, guys. Happy, happy New Year. 2021 is here. We are getting it live. It's only been a couple of days into 2021, and I'm still feeling like I don't want to go back to work. <laughs> But it's all good, though. It's all good. Why am I keep pumping my fist like I'm doing a choo-choo train? If you guys can't see it, go to YouTube. Guys, man, look, we made it. We made it. 2021 is here. 2020 has came, went, left, died. But we're not out the woods yet. Let's just be honest. It may be 2021, but it still feels kind of like 2020, doesn't it? Right? You still got to wear a mask. You still can't go out to these super large gatherings like a crazy person. You still can't go to work like you want, unless you want to. We'll talk about that later. You're still working from home. You're still doing everything online. For me, I think this is the new way. Technology has finally caught up. And it has been thoroughly ingrained in our lives. It was there. It was, it was thoroughly ingrained before, but now it has been the key to a lot of success for many tech companies out there, for many UX designers out there, because without technology, we would not have jobs. So shout out to technology, baby. <laughs> shout out to technology. Woo. Anyways, guys, 2020, man, it was, it started out good. 2020 started out good, and then it got a little crazy. Uh, 2020 for me was both exciting and uh, crazy and interesting and sad, all in the same bundle, all in the same bundle, because at the start of 2020, you know, my wife and I, we took a trip to Austin. We went there for like five days freaking fell in love with the place. My wife went to Anguilla with her with her sister on vacation, you know, and then it got a little sticky. This was this is like January, February, beginning of March. And then it got a little sticky with the whole COVID thing. But for me, um 2020 was pretty interesting. Uh as you guys all know, I got a new job at my current place from working at uh, fleet core, I got a job in the height of, in the height of COVID. <laughs> so I, my, this is, this is the office. This is everything. This is, this is home base for me as far as like job podcasting, my own other unicorns, uh, stuff, a shop, a mentorship, et cetera. Ugly unicorns.com. Check it out. It's been very interesting. Um, 2020, I really got into doing the podcast. If you all know, I really got into doing the YouTube channel, as we already know. I started taking jujitsu a lot more seriously. I started taking my health a lot more seriously. And the later end of actually in the later end of 2020, in the beginning, you know, I felt like everybody else. You know, didn't didn't know what to expect, didn't know what to do. Was eating my feelings. Was eating all my feelings. We know this. Cause I got up to 225 pounds in the height of COVID in the height of my biggest weight. And I got down to 202 
And, you know, that to me, in getting down to 202, I realized, like, I can really lose this weight. And I realized, like, hey, I want to go a little bit further. I want to get down to 195. My ideal weight when I'm, like, I have abs and all these other things going on. That's kind of what I want to get back to. Back to back to how I was when I was, like, 22. Not, not that age because I was, like, 165 back then. Maybe not that skinny, but very muscular. Uh, yeah, uh, ended up in my first jujitsu competition ever. That was the goal of mine going into just going into jujitsu. I just wanted to just try it once. I think I'm a one and doneer. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe when I get my purple belt, I'll compete more because I I want to I want to progress pretty fast in my purple belt. So maybe when I get the purple belt. I might compete a couple times. We'll see. I'm never competing again at blue belt. I'm tired of being a blue belt. <laughs> this might sound so like pretentious, like you're tired of being a blue belt. Whatever. I've been a blue belt for 10 years. I get it. I get it, man. The, everybody's journey is different. But yeah, once I get my purple belt, I'll probably compete a little bit more. I'll do some local tournaments, maybe do some um, international tournaments like the one I did. And I got third place. So and pretty cool with that. Also 2020, you know, I got to do a UX talk, like give like a like a panel talk, a speech, whatever. So now I can call myself a speaker because I got up and spoke in front of people I didn't know who asked me to come onto their platform and speak. And I did. So that was actually one of my goals. I could hopefully I can continue to do more of that in 2021. That is a continuation goal. The the first one was just to get it out the way to say I did it, go achieve. But that is a continuation goal that I want to keep doing more of these things. So I might have to slap that on the board right here what else happened in 2020 man oh man 2020 my sister got married that was pretty interesting got to meet her um now husband and his family they were pretty cool there's a great experience going to that wedding and just really happy to see my younger sister you know get married and see her at with her biggest smile i've ever seen on her face so that that was that was pretty awesome man i got i'm glad that i got to experience that um that was really cool. What else happened in 2020, man? 2020. Yeah, not much after that. <laughs> 2020, like like I said before, uh, still, still, still keeping it popping with the podcast. Still keeping it up with the YouTube. And guess what, guys? This might not seem like a big deal for you guys, but we have crossed over the 400 subscriber mark on YouTube. I know a lot of people like 400, like who cares about 400? Me, I care about 400 because that means I'm reaching out to people who I never reached out to before. I'm touching lives that I never touched before. And people, you know, see my content, they see what I say, they see who I am and they resonate with me. And that to me means so much. You guys have no idea. It might not be the tens of millions of people one day we'll get there, but 400 people subscribe to the YouTube channel, Ugly Unicorns. It's amazing. And I appreciate every last one of you, every last one of you 400 plus people. Let's keep it going. Let's get the 500, 6, 7, 8, 10,000, 11,000, however, however many we could get up to. Tell all your friends, tell your family members to subscribe, like, comment, and hit the notification bell. Don't forget to do that. That way you get all the videos when they come out. And make sure you subscribe to the podcast, UX Unicorns, on any place where you listen to podcasts. Yeah, man, 2020 has been awesome. Yeah, the, the YouTube channel's doing great. The podcast is doing really well. You know, I was also looking at some of my analytics uh, for the podcast and the YouTube channel. According to YouTube, like 80% of you guys are not subscribed that listen that listen and watch the content. So make sure you guys do that, man, because um, you're missing out on some really cool things. And also, this helps me out because the more subscribers I get, the more content that I want to produce and put out there, and it helps you guys. And guess what? You guys are helping me too. And also, um, I was looking at my uh, subscriber base on YouTube versus the subscriber base on the podcast. It is significantly different. It's the same content. What's happening? So on YouTube, like a high percentage of the the people that watch the videos are male. And I was like, what? Okay, that's interesting. But then I go to the actual podcast analytics. It's mostly female. I'm like, what is happening? What is happening? <laughs> 
I don't care, but shouts out to all you guys, wherever you listen to this content, wherever you get this UX content from, doesn't matter if it's on YouTube, doesn't matter if it's on, um, through the podcast. I appreciate you. I thank you. You have made my 2020 that much more special because without the go, without the ongoing support and comments and feedback that I get from all my members, all my audience, peoples, all my subscribers, all my followers, I would not be doing this stuff. Let's just be honest. If I didn't get all those words of encouragement, like, man, keep going. I love your content. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, I really resonated with you. I really like what you said about this. I really like what you said about that. Your story really hit home for me because I was in the same situation or I'm currently in the same situation. Those positive remarks, those positive comments really encourage me to keep going. It really makes me want to keep doing more and more of this stuff. You guys have no idea. And for that, I truly, truly thank you. Thank you so much. But anyways, let's see what happened. Let's see what happens, man. Let's see what 2021 holds. Let's see if we can keep this momentum going. And speaking of going, there are a few things that stopped going in 2020 as far as tech goes. I know probably some of you probably already know about this. You know, the, uh, let me see what it says up here. Let me just scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. The tech that died in 2020. You're in for a doozy. Some of these I've heard of. Some of these I've never heard of. Uh, some of these are like, what? That? That got murdered? That got, that got put? I shouldn't say murder. That one got put out to pasture? Yeah, speaking of pasture, Farmville. Farmville. Does everybody remember Farmville? Farmville. The number one app your auntie kept tagging you on. Jesus Christ, auntie, stop tagging me in your Farmville post. I don't want to grow crops. So apparently Farmville uh, seen its demise on December 31st, 2020. They couldn't wait one more day to say it died in 2021. But anyway, it came out in October 2009. Where was I in 2009? Probably still in college. Uh, It had over 62 million uh, people signed up. I think it was um, on like mostly on Facebook's platform, which is very interesting. So shouts out to all those Farmville players. Even got out to Farmville 3. I didn't even know they had two. Farmville 3? I didn't know you needed... I didn't, Honestly, I didn't know Farmville was a series. I didn't know you could do one, two, or three. Do you have to download a different one? Did you just you just get the update? Like, this is Farmville 3.0, but they just wanted to call it 3. Interesting. Uh, the other one was Google Play Music. Um, this one kind of makes sense because they're kind of leaning into the YouTube music all of a sudden. And you got to think... There's so much different competition as far as like these apps. You have the Amazon, you have the Google, I mean, not the Googles, you have the Apple music and you got Spotify, you got Tidal, you got all the different music players out there. And I guess you could create, I guess Google Play music would make members go to a, um, like a secondary application just to listen to music where people are already on YouTube. They're already watching videos and getting content from there. Why not create? A offset of that call it YouTube music where they don't actually have to leave the platform that they're on 90% of the time. I know I am. That's for sure. Uh, as far as other tech, uh, this is not an app. Per- this is not an app. It's just a, a Nintendo DS. Uh, I did not have one of these. I do not care about these, but apparently 76 million of you guys did because that's how many they sold after 9.5 years. <laughs> Jesus Lord. I've always wanted, um, you know, I always wanted, not a, not a Nintendo, but I always wanted a Sega, a Sega Game Gear. Man, somebody please help me out in the comments if I'm saying that right. Was it a Game Gear by Sega? Man, I, dude, I love Sega so much. It was like one of the first consoles that we got uh, growing up, and I think we got a Nintendo second. I could be wrong about that. I think we probably had Nintendo first, but when Sega came out, it was all the rave. Sonic Man, The Hedgehog, One and Two, Sonic Pinball. Woo! Keeping it gangsta, keeping it gangsta. All right, Wonderlust. Don't know what this is, but uh, the Robins on the Wall for June 15th when Microsoft acquired the company behind Wonderlust, the popular to do list app. 
Yeah, that's why. There's so many freaking to-do list apps out there. Oh, my God. I'm actually thinking about developing one myself. Let me know in the comments if you want that. It's going to be UX focus, and then it's going to have some slight differences to standard uh, to-do list. You'll see. You'll see. You're probably one of my users for your research. But anyways, there's so many to-do lists out there. You have the to-do list that Apple's has called Reminders, and they also have a called Reminders. That's it's it sucks. Uh, Microsoft has one. Also, Microsoft has one built into uh, Office Outlook. Um, it's very interesting. So, I had to check my phone to see if the battery's still Gucci. Yes, it's still Gucci. But yeah, so many to-do lists out there, and um, it's kind of overwhelming. Even Google has a to-do list, and I think you know. Their to-do list is okay. It's not like the best in the world. It's very, very simple, but I'm looking forward to like a to-do list where I can like input some stuff that some some actual detailed notes and do some bulleted list that Apple's reminders does not let you do. Anyways, um, it says, are you still there? AT&T DSL, not the DSL you're thinking about. Get your mind out of the gutter, guys. Stop it. Stop it. We're not in high school. Uh, I didn't even know DSL was still around. Just saying. Just saying. I didn't <laughs> I didn't know this technology still exists. Of course, AT&T would hold on to some bullshit. They hold on to that book. <laughs> oh, my God. Really? DSL? Dude, when did DSL come out? I don't even know. I don't even care. Dude. I remember having DSL. It was like freaking running through mud. Um, Chrome apps. Not to be confused with Chrome extensions. Uh, so Google announced it would be putting the end of the Chrome apps. Not 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 extensions. Um, like I said before, which is uh, those are just standalone web apps that operate. But anyway, I think what it is is the Google apps were like kind of like a wrapper that kind of did certain functionality to your browser. Google's like, we out of here with that noise. We don't need to do that no more. Okay, so we get another app. Uh, Facebook's Windows 10 app. Uh, because I don't use a PC, I didn't even know this was a thing. Why would you need an app for Facebook on your computer? You can just go to the browser, man. What? Really? I guess, I guess because, um, you know, freaking, uh, what's, what's the freaking browser Internet Explorer sucks so bad that they had to build their own damn app just for Facebook because probably accessing window Facebook through IE was such a horrible experience. Facebook's like, you know what? We, we got it. We got it. We, we don't, we, you know what? We don't want your damn browser messing up our shit. So we, we, we'll do it for you. We got it. We got it. Don't, don't worry about it. No, it's fine. We'll do it. No, 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 no. We, no, 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 no. We got it. We got it. We're good. Stay over there. Don't, don't look over here either. Don't look. Don't think. Don't ask. Don't tell. All right. Another one was uh, Mixer. I never heard of Mixer. Uh, people in the comments, let me know. But Microsoft Dream of creating a tech competitor died. Uh, Twitch competitor. Sorry, I said tech competitor. I'm getting so teched out. A Twitch competitor died on July 22nd, 2020. Uh, yeah, if you're not first to the market or better, you're not going to have a great product. So this is, a, this is what I learned in business. Like, either to be successful in a certain type of experience, either you need to be first, means you're the first one to get, you know, indoctrination in, you get users and stuff like that, or you need to be better, Okay. If you don't, if you're not first, you need to be better. If you don't come along and you're not killing it, you ain't going to do well. Look at, um, for example, for example, um, okay. I can't say this because this could go against everything. Actually it does. So, uh, everybody remembers MySpace. MySpace was first, but Facebook came around and guess what? They were better. Boom. There's my example of being better, but not first. Um, there are some instances where you are first. Um, I can't think of any. Is Instagram, was they, were they first? Uh, probably not. Probably not. Probably not. Or, or, or you could say it was uh, Snapchat. They were kind of first. But then, you know, you got TikTok coming out, and they're better. 
anyway, TikTok's kind of like Vine. Okay, I got a question. So, how what what is the difference between Vine and TikTok besides the musical component? Because to me, Vine and TikTok are the exact same thing. It's just on TikTok they have the music rights that they can use all the music and stuff. And I don't really get TikTok. You know, I tried it out. It's pretty damn stupid. Your people just lip syncing the other people's what they're actually saying. Basically, you're doing karaoke. So there's that. So basically, TikTok is annoying karaoke. And karaoke is already annoying. Jesus, crazy. All right. Uh, here's another one. VR Foley's. Uh, at one point, I expect to be a viral. I guess this is, a, this is kind of a competitor to the Oculus Rift that um, that Facebook had. On the mobile side, Google's Daydream VR platform. Yeah, this goes. Oh, this was a Google product? I remember the um, the Daydream VR that Google had. I'm not sure if this is the same thing or this is just, um, this came out of this. But uh, VR Foley's, man, check that out. I probably, I'm going to try to make sure, make sure I post this on the video. Oh, and here's here's one that uh here's one uh tech that died for 2020 and I thought it died a, a, a death 2 years ago, but Flash, Adobe Flash Player. Um there's a correlation between Adobe Flash and Farmville. So Farmville was a Flash-based game and you know, Adobe said, "We out of here with that noise." But by now, and so I guess the two kind of like kind of died around the same time. But I really thought Flash died years ago, guys. I remember coming up through school. We had to learn Flash and doing Flash animations. I even had I even built my own first website. And it had some Flash banners on there. It's so heavy. Jesus Christ. I mean, it took like 40 minutes for your website to load. It was such a heavy, heavy freaking thing to put on your website. It's not, not, not no, don't still do it. Just do Java. Uh, Amazon Echo Look. Um, I don't, I don't know about this one. Never heard of this one, but apparently, this thing uses uh, machine learning to help you with fashion advice. What? Fashion advice? Learning from fashion specialists in the world just based on color, shape, fit, and of course, shoes. So you mean to tell me there's some dudes out there who are like, you know what? Instead of asking my wife, girlfriend, or boyfriend for how this shirt looks, I'm going to ask a machine. Are you serious, bruh? Not even dudes. Sometimes girls, too. You know, same thing. Actually, dude, you better off getting more. Oh, I got a delivery. Holla. And speaking of Amazon, look at that. Dude, I'm not joking. I am not joking. You guys probably heard that. I was just talking about Amazon and freaking Alexa makes a noise. I'm like, I got a package. Dude, they need to stop listening to me. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here, man. I don't want it. Um, here we go. Oh, man. The infamous Windows 7. It has seen its last days in 2020 was the last year it was around. The coveted Windows 7. Was Windows 7 even good? No, without no, that was Windows XP that everybody was like loving on. Like XP, oh my god, XP. And then Windows Vista came out and people were like, oh, yeah, this sucks. <laughs> I had a Windows Vista machine. Christ low, man. It was man, it was mm, it was not great. It was not great. So, guys, that has been the list of uh, tech that has died for 2020. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It's just funny that the last one was like, good riddance. Adobe Flash Player and Windows and the Amazon Echo and Windows 7. Was Windows 7 really that bad? I don't know. Because the last computer I had was a Windows Vista machine. If it's anything worse than that, oh Lord, it was probably the worst thing ever. <laughs> ever. Anyways, guys, um, so, so speaking of 2020, you know, like I said before, we're not at the woods yet. And, you know, this is whole big thing about <clears throat> working from home and, and how that works out and different things like that. 
I just want to say this, man. Um, working from home in the beginning. So in the beginning, as we all know, I used to be a freelancer person. And I did that on the side. It was kind of enjoyable. But I thoroughly enjoyed going into the office. I really liked interacting with different people, conversing with people in person. I really enjoyed that throughout my career and all all up to the COVID problem. All up to COVID problem. So like I really, I really, I really enjoyed, you know, going to the office. I actually moved here to Duluth because I thought we were going to go into the office. Eight and eight, nine months, ten months later, we're not in the office. And so I started my, so I started off, you know, my first UX job working in the office. First, we were in Norcross, then we moved to actual Buckhead, and we were in the um, Determinist building on the 22nd floor. <clears throat> great views. That, that's it. Just great views. And brand new office. Um, just cub- standard cubicle life, you know, standard standing desk type of stuff, you know people all around you hovering watching you etc cetera, etc cetera. everybody every top level executive in their freaking glass office looking like fish as you walk by and you know they're just watching you just very very weird stuff and you don't realize it's weird until you take a step back and say like why are we going into a what for take listen to this i always say this to my wife she thinks it's hilarious I'll say like, hey, babe, why do I, I live in a box, right? I go outside, I get on a box, I get inside of a box with wheels. I take that box, drive to another box, go to that box, go inside of that box, and then sit inside of another box. What are we doing? Why is this the way that we have to work? Why was this the standard way of working? I, I, I live in a box. Inside that box are more boxes. I even sleep on a, a bed that's in the shape of a box. My computer's a box. This freaking thing right here is a box. This is a box. You feel, you feel where I'm going? My phone's a box too. I just scratched my table. My phone's a box too. So, but I live in a box. I get in the side of a box with wheels. I drive to a gigantic box. I get inside of that box and I'm sitting in smaller gray boxes, AKA cubicles, 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 cubicles. Where's my stapler? Where is my stapler? Why are companies set up with this false sense of personal space this false sense of personal space they have this they want to have this open this open concept deal right but they know that open concept can has it can have its flaws so what they try to do is they try to give you this false sense of your own private space by giving you gray dividers aka cubicles and people take these cubicles as like real personal space like you do know that you don't own this desk you do know that you don't own this computer you do know all that and it's very interesting that people feel i'm sorry i'm getting text messages from my wife she's known doing a podcast i wish she wouldn't do that but it's it's not real. And I think the good thing about 2020 is that we were able to actually take a step back, reassess, and and realize like, hey, working in boxes and going to going to inside that box and working to a working inside of a smaller, grayer box is not worth it. It's not worth it at all because people, from what, they, from what studies have shown, from what I have ex- personally experienced, is that I am way more productive when I'm inside my own box, my own personal box, my own real personal box, not this fake one that 
that has been developed by these companies. And because of that, you are more comfortable. You don't have somebody breathing on your shoulder. Remember that, remember that creative director I talked about from years ago that sit on my shoulder and tell me how to move and click. I don't, there's none of that here in person. So with that, I feel like I'm way more productive because guess what? There are less distractions, less distractions. What are you talking about? Less distractions, Eric. I have kids. I have a dog. I have this. I have that. True. I didn't say there were zero distractions. I said less distractions. Home skillet. Listen to the words. Don't interject. So what do I mean by less distractions? Well, when I was working inside those boxes with cubicles, you got your boss asking you for stuff. You got your coworkers around you asking you for stuff. You got people asking you to go to lunch. You got people asking you to stay late. You got people asking you to do last minute shit. You got people asking you to do this. You got people asking you to go to this meeting, go to that meeting, go to this meeting, do this, do that. All the other jazz, pushing and pulling everywhere. And about time you have time to actual work, it's almost time to go home. Well, guess what? When I'm at my house, my wife doesn't bother me. My dogs don't bother me because my wife does the dogs. I do the dogs around lunchtime and after work. So the only actual distractions I have are the ones that are being uh, produced through email or a Slack or a, a, a Teams, right? And that is it. But also, if you get rid of all the extra nonsensical meetings that people have, you might have even less distraction because that is one thing that is a pitfall of working remote uh, full time is that people feel like because they are not talking to you all the time, they're not talking to you 24 seven, they're not in your freaking face all the time that you are not being productive or you are not working or business is not moving. That is the opposite of what is actually happening because people think this way, they halt a lot of production. They halt a lot of progress because they feel like we need to have an hour meeting about everything. We don't need to have an hour meeting about everything. Sometimes you can do it through one email. Like, hey, man. Hey, like, hey, let's schedule 15 minutes and talk about such and such. Why? Can we just send it through an email? Can I just do it through a Slack? Everything doesn't require a, a freaking conversation or a freaking meeting. Like, I have stuff to do. I work eight hours in a day. I don't need to have four hours of meetings in a day. And sometimes, guys, I have more, I have more hours in a meeting than that. I remember one time I had six hours in meetings in one day. No lie. And I had two hours to do actual work. Not my fault. Because they said those meetings were urgent and required and I needed to be there. So now, now that I'm in the game a lot longer, now I'm like, all right, I assess each meeting. I look at it like this. Do I actually need to be there? And who can I follow up with if I'm not there that could give me actual stuff, actual advice? And is this and this is actual meeting super relevant to what I'm actually doing or is this just the meeting just the just the talk shit or to the gossip or to the to, to talk trash or whatever is it that type of meeting because like sometimes we don't need meetings I remember one time this is probably like last week I don't know why I did this but rookie mistake on my part never do it again there's this whole flow I talked about that I did for a certain particular flow and I wanted to like go over it and talk about it, et cetera. And before, before the meeting happened, like I had like, um, had PMs and every people like that look at it. We all went through it, et cetera, et cetera, before we wanted to present to the stakeholders and everything was all good. And I scheduled a meeting for an hour. Uh, thinking that, you know, because, because of history has shown that we get into these meetings and people talk about things that have nothing to do with the meeting. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to allot for some time like this, but that's how other people, that's how other people would produce meetings. For some reason, 
that goes out the window with me. And I was just trying to follow suit what other people have done. And I just get straight to the point. I'm like, hey, we got this product. We got this. We got this flow. We got this. Let's jump into it. I don't like wasting people's time. I don't like I don't like bantering. I don't like talking about your mom, your dad, your sister, your cousin, your brother, whatever. That's your own personal life. We can do that on a later talk. But for this, we need to talk about this. And I like getting straight to the point with these meetings. So I get into the meeting. I jump straight to the point. The meeting lasted 15 minutes. Total. That was it. Dude, there's 45 minutes left on this freaking day. I was like, dang. All right. Next time, 15 minute meeting. That's it. Especially for something that was that small. I should have known better not to waste people's time and schedule a meeting for a freaking hour. But I gave them, I gave them all their time back. But that just goes to show like sometimes, um, you don't need to have a meeting or sometimes you just need to make your meetings a lot shorter. You, everything doesn't need to be 30 minutes. Everything doesn't need to be an hour. Sometimes you can just do a 15, 10 minute meeting, five minute meeting and call it a day. And sometimes the meeting can just be, Hey, here's my update through Slack done. That's it. We don't need it. So I'm this. Yeah. That's the one good thing about 2020 was like, it made me re- it made a lot of people realize and a lot of companies realize the value of being home and the value of family because you know sometimes people had these hour long commutes two hour long commutes and you know some people like some people like commuting i personally do not like commuting yes i was able to listen to a lot of podcasts and different things like that but that was only a means to an end because i didn't want to drive myself freaking crazy it's so boring just to drive an hour to work every day and an hour to work back. That's two hour round trip. Sometimes people are driving two hours one way. That's a four hour round trip. That's a long day. And so there are a lot of companies assessing whether or not they want to go back into the office and do the whole box inside of a box thing. Cause a lot of companies, for example, like Pinterest, like they had this whole lease that they had and they canceled their lease and it cost them like $90 million or something like that. Right. But the interesting thing is that it was more cost effective for them to cancel the lease than to actually keep the lease. Think about that guys. Think about how much money Pinterest would have spent trying to house individuals. Why? Why, why do we have to do that? Why do we have to be there? If we are in the age of tech and we're able to do everything through Slack, video calls, emails, et cetera, why do I have to sit next to you? I don't get it. Why do I need to sit next to you? Why do I have to be in the same building as you? Why do I need to see what, why? If I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to see you anyway. I remember working at this one place where I didn't see my manager for two weeks. We only correspond through email and, and, and Slack. And we're in the same building. I was on the first floor. He was on the third floor. Or fourth floor. Forget which one. But I didn't see this guy for two weeks. And guess what? It got work done. And I'm thinking in my mind, why am I driving an hour every day to be here? If I don't see actual people that I work with, what is the point? And some people are like, oh, you know, I really like going into the office. I really like being in person, talking to people. That's you. That's not everyone. I think they did a poll where like 70 or 80 percent of people wanted to continue to work from home. This is this is America wide. And if you're one of those companies who are like, doesn't listen to the data or doesn't understand the data and and how relevant that is, then you are the problem because if people don't want to go into work and sit in a box that's inside of a box, why would you force them to do that? Because sometimes it can can create certain anxieties in people because they feel like, you know, they're always, they're, they're always doing it too, way too much or they're being pushed and pulled way too many directions or they're feeling like their boss is lingering or hovering or being a control person or being a micromanage and all the other jazz. You can eliminate that because you can't micromanage me inside of my own house. You can reach me through Slack or email, but you can't be like physically here standing over my shoulder. 
because I'm going to be way more productive in my house than you standing over me. And they, and that makes me question, what are you doing? Why are you not being as productive as you should be? And also, it can also help companies realize like, hey, we got some redundant positions here. Right? You could be like, okay, when we're in office, we had so-and-so, XYZ, XYZ. Now that we're in the office, what exactly is their role again? And some of that has happened too, where you see redundancies in your business. You're like, man, we're wasting a lot of money in this particular section of our business. We got to get rid of this particular role or we got to get rid of this particular vendor, or et cetera, et cetera, because you realize when you're in the thick of it, right? When you're, when you're at ground zero, when you're in the details, you don't get to see the, you don't get to see the forest from staring at the trees. You know what I'm saying? You got to take a step back and see like, oh, this has gotten, this has gotten out of hand. This has gotten way too crazy. We got to, we got to get rid of some of these things. And some, and companies are starting to realize this too. And so, yeah, this, it's been very interesting. And I got a question the other day about like, you know, what, what is it like working with, you know, large versus, you know, smaller companies? And I think it depends on the particular company, but most, I would, I would say this, um, most large corporate companies um, that I work for are very, very, very corporate, uh, very, uh, let's say, political. You can't say, do, act certain ways because there's always somebody watching you. You know, um, I used to work at this big company called Disney. And Disney has a certain reputation that they perceive out there. And the people that work there carry that reputation, even if they don't agree with it, even if they don't agree with Disney's ideologies and values, et cetera people automatically assume that you carry those same values. So when you act out in a certain way that that's not to what they perceive Disney to be, you get looked at in a certain way. And I think that goes for most, most large companies, even smaller companies too. You know, I work for, this could do even more so with smaller companies. I work for some smaller companies who are like super grimy, you know, super, super salesy, super like, you know, you know, this super marketing focus, not really, don't really care about the actual people or users that are actually buying the product. They care about, hey, we're going to make this, we're going to put it out there, we're going to market it. Not really asking like, do you guys need this? This is something This is something that you would need, something that you're looking for. They would just make it and just shove it in your face and 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 put all this energy into marketing and put all the energy into sales and that's how they would present their business as a marketing sales focused type of business, not actually a user or design based type of uh, type of business. I worked at some companies like that too. And, you know, within, and what people have to understand is like, it's not necessarily the company that is that way. People make the company without the people, you don't have the company. So I think when you get to, working at a huge corporation, there are different types of people, right? There are different types of, you know, ideologies, values, methods that are being deployed because everybody in there is totally different. It's very diverse. I was, so in, in that sense, it's very diverse. But you could work for a smaller company and they could be, they could be diverse, but sometimes that company is an echo chamber. Because they're a small company, they need to move fast, whatever, and they want to be, and they want to feel comfortable. They want to hire people who are just like them. They want to hire people who are yes men. They want to hire people who won't challenge them, and that is also not good, <laughs> because you have no diversity. You have no, uh, you don't have different ideals being floated around as well. I don't really know what I'm trying to say, but. <laughs> There's definitely a huge uh, difference between working for a small company versus a large company. And here are some positive benefits that I would say uh, for one of those, for each of those. So working with a large company, um, you know, sometimes you have job security there. 
because you know that company is going to be around. They've been around for, you know, a certain amount of years. They produce a certain amount of income and revenue. They do this. They're probably a leader in their space, et cetera. So therefore, you know, there's, um, you know, they're, there's, they're, they're always going to be there. There's room for advancement because there's levels to the game because, you know, there's manager one, two, three, whatever, on up to the CEO. And you know that you are able to progress within that company. You can also, you're, because it's such a huge company, they bring in a lot of revenue. So you, therefore, you know that you can make a certain amount of money each step you go. You can make more money, make more money, make more money because those companies have the resources to do that. Also, bigger companies might have more resources, more resources to train and develop, you know, younger talent, people that can come in who might not have the, you know, quote unquote, all the skills, but they're able to train those people to get them up to a, to a speed and level that they like to see people at. And most big companies have a lot of patience. Most big companies, uh, I feel have a lot of patience because why would you hire an internship? Like look at Disney. Disney has a lot of patience. They hire interns all the time. Not going to get into why they do it, but just saying that's another topic. But anyway, they hire interns and interns. I mean, they don't have 10, 15 years of experience doing something. Sometimes they have zero. So Disney has a lot of patience and a lot of, and a, I'm not saying all, but most large companies have a lot of patience in that sense where they'll hire an associate, they'll hire an internship, they hire an intern, they hire a junior because they want to bring them up to a level to where they want them to be versus hiring uh, a super senior person who's stuck in their ways, who's not willing to bend or flex. Sometimes you might need that because you want to bring in a certain, you want to bring in a different type of blood to the business. And so that could be good in a sense, but also negative in a sense where this person won't take take advice. They've always done it this way. What they think is how it should be. And that could be detrimental to your culture as well. But, you know, sometimes um, with smaller companies, it could be it could be beneficial in a sense where they're they're more apt to hiring people who have a little bit more experience. Because they might not have the the resources or the time or the patience to to hire an intern or junior or apprentice level person because they don't might not have the resources or the time to try to train that person up, right? So with that, you know, you do get you know a certain type of culture. You can probably get a certain type of income. You might not can get all the income, but you can get a certain type of culture, certain type of income. You can also go in. Straight to being a senior designer when you go into these type of small companies. That has happened to me. I worked for this one company. I was creative director. I was art director. I was this. I was that. All these high level titles because guess what? You're the only guy that's doing it. And that could also be a good thing if you're into that where you get to you get to dipple and dabble into a lot of different things. So you get to do some, for my experience... I got to do graphic design, videography, uh, cinematography, uh, motion graphics, 2D animation, um, uh, what I was corp- corporate videos, et cetera, uh, audio, editing and podcasts, and all this other different jazz. All the things that I've learned, I do now. I do now for uh, Ugly Unicorns, the podcast, the website, my current job. I take all those things that I learned, I apply it to myself now. Now I have a lot of different skills. I can, I can move in a lot of different directions if I want to. So that is the one good thing about working at a smaller company versus a big company. Because sometimes at a big company, they got a specialist for everything. Not every company, not every large company, but think about Google man, or Facebook. They have a specialist probably for every single role. They got a specialist for uh, interaction designer. Uh, researchers, motion designers, UX designers, product designers. Those are single lanes that those people do on the day to day. And I feel like if those single lane people were to go work for a smaller company, they would have to learn a lot of different things that they, that they weren't doing over those, over those many years. So if you're like a, if you go into a company and you're just only a UX researcher and then you want to leave and you want to go somewhere else to a smaller business or start your own, or start your own thing. Not only are you the researcher, now you got to do the UX, you got to do the UI, things you probably weren't really good at in the first place. 
Now you have to do. So that is one good thing about maybe starting out as maybe starting out in a uh, smaller company. Like I said before, sometimes smaller company, they want to look for the, the high level senior person to come in and do different things. But sometimes you'll, you'll get lucky where you're able to go in as a junior and you get to work with that senior designer because they see value in developing and training and mentorship. So that's something that they are, that's, that's something that they feel that they want to do. They'll hire somebody to do that with. I've, I've done that before where we hired somebody who was not such a great graphic designer, but I knew I wanted to, to lead, develop and train and mentor an individual. And that was also a selling point when we put out the job, the job application, like, you know, mentorship with, you know, art director, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what I did. And I like doing it and I'm still doing it today, but through, you know, through the website, uh, uglyunicorns.com through mentorship and also through the podcast and the YouTube videos. So I've always had a, always had a, uh, a knack for, and a want for, for helping and, and mentoring and shaping up young designers, all those fresh UXs out there. But I would say those are kind of like the two uh, differences and, you know, working for a small company versus a giant conglomerate company like a Facebook or whatever. Um, like I said, like it's not always, it's, like I said, it's not always the case. It's, it's not concrete. There's different, there's different variables and levels to each one of these different things. There's different nuances. And sometimes, you know, you could have a huge company, right? But it has the culture and the mindset of a small company. And how you navigate those waters is is a little tricky because I feel like it could be more political than anything because it could be a situation to where like my mom's mom mom's worked here and they still work here and I grew up in doing this, et cetera, et cetera. So you could meet people who have been with the company a lot of years and their their parents were doing the same thing and they have clout. Or whatever. So you gotta be you gotta be careful navigating those waters as well. You gotta be very, very uh MacGyver esque in navigating those waters because they might be a small company and this this person might be uh like a low tier executive or a manager, but they could be best friends with the CEO. They could have the CEO's ear. So you might wanna be careful who you talk to and how you talk to them. We should just do that with anybody, but it's definitely in those big corporations with a small corporation's mindset. So I think that's all I wanted to talk about. Oh, also, um, one thing I am working on currently. So I notice that um a lot of people, a lot of UX designers out there, especially new ones, um, they keep I keep seeing, I, I'm guilty of this too. They keep using and in, in, I keep seeing the same mock-ups for every dang website and they're starting to look the same. What am I talking about by mock-ups? I'm talking about like, like the phone mock-ups, the laptop mock-ups, the iPad mock-ups, things that you would help to make your design feel real to somebody else because you know that it's just the mock-up and they can't really get it on their actual device. So what you would do is you would take your design artwork. Just, these are all Photoshop things that you would have to use. It could be like a picture of a, of a person holding a phone, right? And you can comp it and put your actual screen on that phone to make it look like somebody's actually holding the phone with your app on it. And a lot of, I see a lot of like designers out there, new and old, using, reusing, and doing the same ones all over the internet. There's no new life out there. There's no new, no new blood out there. And so what I did was I decided to just make my own. <laughs> I definitely did. I made my own, um, my own mock-ups. Let me see if I can show you guys. My computer wants to be slow again. So I, I was, you know, I used to do this back in the day when I was a um, graphic designer. And so I learned this technique working at a um, nutraceutical company. This is how I, I learned how to do this stuff. And you could do it to a lot of different things. And so 
what I'm showing on the screen here now is just, um, this is me holding my iPhone, right, up to the camera. And I just did my own mock-up because I'm tired of seeing the same ones on the internet over and over and over again. How do I bring new life to my website to where somebody comes on web my website? They're like, oh, that doesn't look like the last person we've seen. So these are just some different um, mock-ups that I did that I particularly took myself using the camera that I have here and the skills and the knowledge that I gained over the years. And it's a little bit of finessing. And I just made these, I made these mock-ups. Um, this did not take me very long. This is kind of easy. And so I'm I'm only saying that to say this is like. My goal is to make my own set of ugly unicorns, um, mock-ups um, for phones, tablets, and computers, because I think that these are needed, and this this to bring new life into the um, to the field. So right now you can pick these up for four ninety nine. I'm gonna be making more in the and making more later. I'm gonna be doing uh, iPad Pro because I own one. And I'm going to use it and my new um, MacBook Pro 16 inch um, laptop because it's here. Why not? And I'm doing this to, to not only help myself, but to help you guys as well. Because, you know, once you look a little different, you can stand out just a little bit more. And I think this is going to be very useful. I mean, I did this before um, when I had my own store called Pixel Pusher Market. Uh, I don't have it anymore. Uh, story about that later, how that happened, how it just fell apart. Well, I didn't fall apart. I deleted the database. But anyway, who cares, man? What you talking about? You deleted the database. Well, uh, what happened was uh, I was trying to update my other website and I forgot that everything's connected to one uh, account and I deleted one of the databases and that database happened to be the marketplace. And I'm like, ah, oh, shit. Um, I guess I'm not going to be remaking that again, but what I will do is I will take all the assets that I, that I used to sell with and just put them on the website and call them mock-ups. So you guys can go to uglyunicorns.com right now, uh, slash mock-ups. I just go to ugly unicorns, go into the shops, uh, go to, go under UX tools and look at mock-ups and you can see them there. I'm going to be putting more mock-ups, um, every week, every month, whatever. Um, let me get, let me guys know what you want to see. Um, I think I'm going to put some mock-ups in there from, uh, my other stuff too. For all you, uh, graphic designers out there, you can, you can use this as well. It won't be just only devices. It could be other things as well. Um, so that's what I've been working on. I also been working on updating my, uh, portfolio. A lot of people have been asking like, yo, where's your work at? I don't see your work, man. Like, well, here's the work. And guess what I'm using? Here's one of my mock-ups that I use to do my application called Fresh UXer. Uh, it's a mentorship thing. But anyways, you come here, look at the other one. Here is the journey app for jujitsu practitioners. That's a, this look pretty good, man. I ain't gonna lie. This looks pretty good. These mock-ups look pretty damn good. I kept them basic and simple. Uh, but yeah, I call this one dark mode and this one is light mode. But anyways, I'm still working on my portfolio. As you all know how I do it, I just upload as I go. And so right now, um, the only pro the first product I have on here is Fresh UXer. I'm going through it. It's not done like I said, so I'm still working on some things, but I'm going through the overview, the research part of it right now. Um, scroll down. I'm talking about the, the UX process and what I'm doing. I'm breaking it down. So I'm going through the research. Here are the um, personas, affinity mapping, the question table to help me find patterns within the questions, some desk research. You know, people call it secondary research that I've done, some competitive analysis. And I um, also did a visual breakdown of the data using uh, some making some infographics because, you know, most people like lists, but some people like to see it visually. Um, you guys can get some inspiration from this um, particular um, uh, portfolio website. Also going through some ideation, potential solutions, going through some sketches right here. And um, yeah, and that's where I got to. 
sketches. So right now I'm going to work on um, getting my user flow in there, my mockups and my prototype also in there as well. So guys, check it out. If you want to go to uglyunicorns.com, you can check out the mockups. You can check out some other things on the website. I'm be adding more mockups in. I think I'm going to, it, it's just because it's under UX tools. I'm going to add in some different types of mockups in there as well. It could, it could be freaking sign mockups. Who cares? But they're all going to be different because they're going to be the ones that I make. And not a lot of people are going to have them. So you're going to stand out a little bit more than somebody else. Um, so yeah. So here, so you also go to um, Fresh UX or you can check out that particular project that I've been working on. Um, eventually, I'm going to turn this into a real application. Um, so it could be live out there in the wild to actually help people because this is the goal. This is like real research that I've done to like try to figure out what, how could we help, you know, fresh UXs or new people coming into the design industry transfer over into that, making that career change. So you guys can see the breakdown and background. I actually interviewed um, six people and to get their insight. I did this uh, last year. and um, yeah, so I'm going to take this real data that I collected in this real process that I created and make a real app later in the future. And you will catch that on the app store. And that is where we're at. Anyways, guys, I appreciate you following along. I appreciate everybody subscribing. And thank you so much for subscribing. Like I just said, we've got over 400 subscribers on the YouTube. Woo -woo. Let's keep it up. Let's keep 2021 rolling and popping. I thank you, everybody, for... um. For just being you for like I said before in the beginning. I just want to thank everyone for, you know, following Ugly Unicorns, following the podcast. Um, you know, I'm trying to build a community up so we all could be ugly unicorns, not just me, but all of you guys, right? Anyways, guys, like, comment, and subscribe and turn on that post notifications. All that stuff really helps with the YouTube algorithm because if you like the video and comment. A lot more people see it and a lot more people see it a lot more people can see and get some gain some insight and some inspiration from the channel and make sure you go to listen to, to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and that is it and like i always say guys don't just be a unicorn be an ugly unicorn peace